that I thought in the first part I just wanted to go back to the theme that we began last week, which was part six of the book, which is the section on cyber bodies. And we began the discussion on cyber bodies last time. So I thought, well, I just wanted to go to focus on one article in particular, which because it's really, uh, for myself, it's I think it's just a really key article because it is this concept of blurred boundaries that it has in it. And it's by the article number 32, which is on page uh, 504, I guess. Yeah, 504. It's by Ella Carey, Roseanne Stone. But uh, she goes always by the name of Sandy Stone. And she's really an interesting person and a really important writer and has written some great books on technology. It's a very nuanced person. And she's been responsible for and development of a very good symposium, very good congress and convention that sort of moved around the world, a cyber culture convention that's occurred in many different countries of the world. And she always, every year with a smattering of money, puts this together, brings a lot of interesting people together, you know, working, think uh, people working either in the uh, technology industry itself, people thinking about technology or artists itself. And then Sandy Stone is herself just a really great performance artist. So she's a really interesting person to read because, you know, she's just, she has really something to say. So I just wanted to begin class tonight by focus, just going back to the section on cyber bodies that we began last class and focusing on Sandy Stone's uh, perspective in particular. And then after I do that, and we sort of we discuss that, then really uh, would like, and I don't want to traumatize anybody in the class or anything, but it would be really nice if some people, as we discussed last week, as like Amy did, just would present your projects. Because I think the projects in this class are really fantastically interesting. Now I know that a number of you are, like, are shy and things like this, I can understand that. But I, certain people from like Ethiopia have pretty interesting perspectives. And I know they're not going to say anything. <laughs> but there are a lot of, what I found in this class was reading the papers, I thought, well, this is really great because there's really like, so many just interesting like singular projects that reflect your own backgrounds and your own ways of sort of understanding things. I thought, well, they're really great. And in addition to the individual project, then there's a series of like group projects where in fact people are writing from the perspective of different countries. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. Like Margarita and Ricardo, you know, speaking from the perspective of the question of what, from a Colombian perspective, what's the meaning of the question of technology and what are the specific contradictions in Colombia in terms of these, it really seems like a really radically divided society on the question of technology with the government's project on the one hand. So. If people, you know, feel, felt sort of they want to talk about that, I just think that it would really be wonderful. And these needn't be long, and uh, it's not Tromaville or anything like this. It just, you know, the projects are just interesting, and it'd be very nice if you just, even if you could just speak briefly about it, or if anyone's done multimedia work, you know, the work should be presented. We, after all, have some great screens here and stuff like this. Do you have a question? Can I ask you a very quick thing? Just to uh, circle with something that happened with the mental side of Spider Man. Steve Mans, yeah. yeah. So, um, so what happened was he, he went going to the uh, Nova Scotia, and he was going to the test center, and I think to their airport, and he was asked, and he got into the flight, it might be a bomb, so he started taking part of the equipment, they were going to destroy the $50,000 movie, just lecture about it, getting all kinds of stuff. Steve? Yeah. When did this happen? Uh, a couple of months back. Oh, like wow. Hours, so I thought that was very interesting. No, I didn't know. He had to be at... Yeah, he's going to help rebuild lots of gyms in China and stuff. Oh, wow. No, uh, Steve, didn't t Steve told me last time I saw him because we did a thing together in Toronto, a, a D conference, and Steve had told me he had really is stopping traveling. He says he's just been searched so often at airports. <laughs> it's been happening to a lot of people actually. Just you get a, you get you're targeted at airports. You know you're profiled, and so it doesn't matter. It's not even international traveling. You're like in the United States, and you're just every airport. You're just going to be s get the same kind of routine and stuff. So for Steve, that's really painful actually. That's really not good stuff. So it will lead to many good performances along his career. Yeah, the Steve Mann, uh, you know, um, he just wrote to me. He sent me an email, and he didn't even mention anything about this. I'm gonna, tonight I'll be saying, Steve, what's happening in Nova Scotia? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, Steve is such an interesting person. I mean, it's a really rare person who's, you know, teaches in the Department of Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto, and at the same time, uses the money he's got from his patent and inventions and wearable computers to set up his own art gallery right across from the AGO in Ontario. And really, in a deep, deep way, is thinking of what it really means to be in a culture of surveillance, where you have, in fact, no privacy at all. What kind of ways do you have of resisting this and sort of 
cutting back on this much. Really, it's just really good stuff. Thanks for paying, thanks for attending. That's great. Okay, so for presentations later, uh, who will present? Project D Wired. Yeah, yeah, it's too bad, but the one participant will present. A pro D Wired is a good project. Although by the end of it, I was lusting for. I must say, I was seduced by the notion of technology again. <laughs> It had this opposite effect on me. <laughs> uh, okay, dewired. But dewired is really, really good. And the letters that went back and forth, I thought were interesting. And then how the text in the middle stops typing and then it goes into writing and stuff like this. Is the body gradually becomes dewired and stuff like this. And it's a really good project. So it's good. And um, who next? The um, Marc Andre, the waste disposal plan. Going to present on this? Yes? Tromado, Tromado. <laughs> okay, and um, the technology and radio, yeah. Dennis, you're going to present, and you're going to present this piece that you just gave me. Uh, no, I'm just no, I think I should take your paper back and remark it then. Well, I'm just joking, you Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Teachers should never joke on that. <laughs> okay, and uh, Sasha, were you going to say something about your project? Take back all those nasty things you said about Bureau and Grow. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the after crash? Katriana? Um, do you have a CD player here? Uh, this, we have everything here. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's a CD player. We'll check it. We'll check it out anyway. Okay. And uh, Duncan, you could at least say one word about your, sure. just one word, and maybe show a little bit of your video or something like this, because it really is a really good project. It's really interesting. Okay, and then uh, for next, I don't know, we can't, we're not going to get through everyone this week, but then the week after next, why don't we have other presentations? The work in this class is really interesting projects and has it's just, you know, really individual perspectives and serious perspectives on the ways of understanding technology. So there's a text in the class and there's discussions in the class and then there's your own perspective on what's important and interesting that you want to speak about and stuff like this. Like yours, you can sp speak about I liked your paper a lot because I thought it's a paper that any kind of cyber kid would be reading saying, I know that. Parents try to put their controls <laughs> to go right around it. <laughs> it's a good project. So you're going to, you'll be speaking about it a little bit? Maybe. <laughs> it's good, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Okay, so let's go to, let me just start it off though, if I can, just by cyber bodies, just because this, I think this perspective of Sandy Stone is interesting. And go, have you read Cyber Bodies? I mean, excuse me, have you read Roseanne Stone's article, Will the Real Body Please Stand Up? I know you have nothing else to do and it's such a relaxing time of year and stuff like this. So this is Sandy Stone's article, page 504. It's Will the Real Body Please Stand Up? And the context for this article is we began to speak about last week, which was that we are in, uh, in a section six of the book and the section is devoted to the question of cyber bodies itself. And this section, and it really has just interesting articles like Deborah Lupton's article, The Embodied Computer User, and Balsamo's project, The Virtual Body in Cyberspace. And then no sooner do you get through Roseanne Stone's article than you get Tim Leary's article, The Cyberpunk, The Individual as Reality Pilot. So these are really, and then uh, of course Jennifer Gonzalez's Envisioning Cyborg Bodies, Notes from Current Technology. We can't talk about all five articles I thought last week just sort of introduced, you know, generally uh, Deborah Lupton's article and Alan Balsamo's article itself. And the, the uh, context from that, just to sort of set the stage for the discussion of Sandy Stone's article, was that we were beginning to discuss this kind of, you know, really deeply emotional and psychological relationship between machines and ourselves, between machines and our bodies. And the argument that's made in this is that what happens, in fact, in culture, in which your body is sort of swept over all the time and sort of massaged in your swimming in like a sea of screens. The screen of the computer, the screen of television, the screen of the ATM, team, the ATM machine, where the prosthetic is the mouse, where you click in, you surf, and you're never completely confident that in fact you sort of have this sort of like this autonomous body standing outside technology or the tech is beginning to sweep over you itself. And then Sandy Stone, you know, in her article where the real body stands up, says, well, things get, you know, a bit more problematic when, in fact, machines are not understood as these kind of inert things, but, in fact, the relationship is complex and the machines, as she says, begins to get restless. 
What happens, in fact, when the machines both speed up and speed ourselves up? What about when machines begin to blur the boundaries between what's our bodies and what's culture, what's nature and ourselves? What happens, in fact, when, you know, in the space of a very short period of time, historically, we've just been, you know, completely flipped through these four different phases. When, you know, the mid-1600s, and she begins, like the text saying this, you know, we, you know, we become like literate people. We become people of the Gutenberg, um, you know, people of the Gutenberg galaxy. We begin to go into print culture itself. And we, you know, we no longer exist outside literacy or even outside, out, out, excuse me, outside understand ourselves outside literacy, but we live in an epoch of, you know, the beginning of text itself. And then in the 1900s, in the late 1900s, suddenly we go into electronic communication and the second epoch, as she says, begins. And it's no longer an epoch where media simply means textual media, but suddenly media become to be electronic media, the media of radio, the media of telegraphs, the media of television itself. And then we get through that and then in the 1960s, suddenly electronic media become really intensive and suddenly we're sort of, you know, rammed really quickly into a world of information technology. And you have a few, like, I think, really far-sighted authors on the question of technology, like Donna Haraway writing, who, you know, like really on the midst, of, almost in the midst of this happening, then begin to theorize this and say, well, really, we're, you know, we're no longer like in a textual culture. We're no longer simply in the culture of electronic communication but we're in a culture of what she calls the informatics of domination, the informatics of domination. And then Sandy Stone sort of comes on the stage and says, well, we've gone through these three phases already. That's our kind of nature and the kind of argument that she's going to be making. But what happens, in fact, when the stage of technology, the year of technology in which we live, is not text, and it's not simply electronics, it's not simply the screen, and it's not simply information technology, but we live in a culture where the technology itself has gone virtual, where the technology has a lot to do with, you know, cybernetity, where something like the computer itself almost comes alive, and we begin to live within, you know, flows of wireless data itself. And things like data archives and data banking and data mining and this kind of strange relationship between our body and the data flows that are taken to represent our bodies becomes just sort of a constant refrain, a sort of a constant, uh, c the constant context within which our life has happened. And what happens when we no sooner get into like, you know, digital culture, and when digital culture itself is like really intensified by the fact that a second great revolution, you know, a fundamental change in the nature of technology happens, and that has a lot to do with genetic engineering and, recon you know, molecular biology. And suddenly, our bodies themselves are capable of being engineered itself. So Sandy Stone begins with that point, And she says, well, how do we understand the kind of stress that the body is under? Like, what happens to these bodies, to these cyber bodies, when they're really put under intensive forms of stress itself? And so to go back now to the different articles in this section, Deborah Lufton's article and Ann Balsamo's article, Timmy V. Leary, Leary's article, all of them are asking that question in one way or another. Like you go back to like Deborah Lufton's article, who says, you know, that we have the image of, you know, like the, you know, kind of a stereotyped image of the idealized computer user, which is to say sort of a hacker who's taken to be sort of like completely seduced by computer technology itself. But people like, you know, Deborah Lufton or another great science fiction writer like Bruce Sterling would say, we actually go talk to hackers. You know, and in fact, you find, in fact, that their bodies are not separate from the computer technology. Bruce Sterling, for example, in a book that he wrote on computer hackers, said, you know, computer hackers, when you actually go to their homes and talk to them, you know, they're very smart, but they really have strong personalities. They squeal in one another. Oftentimes, they're very arrogant. They're sometimes malicious. They're prone to acts of bravura. Bravura, they you know, sort of congregate, sometimes work alone, sometimes works in crowd itself. They're also sometimes obsessive. They're really addicted to computer technology. And Bruce Sterling draws the computer, draws the conclusion that when we're in this newest phase of technology, in the phase of technology of like cyberspace and digital reality and virtual reality, it's not that our bodies are separate from the machines, but the relationship becomes really complex and that the machines themselves, like the computers,
become a way of playing out our psychological identities. The computers become a way of playing out our psychological identities. And, you know, I told you about, you know, a conference I was at two years ago in Toronto where so many, just struck by it, it was so incredible that so many CEOs from corporations got up who in their, they would all begin with a confession of who they were when they were young. And their constant confession was that they were really deeply dysfunctional personalities. Had no friends. You know, one guy from degree zero said his mother wanted to kick him out of the house at the age of 13. She said she'd really had enough of him. They had real troubles in their house. And in every case, the singular kind of epiphanous experience happened. And that is that they turned on computer screens and suddenly they said they found like something deep inside them psychologically sort of identified and found a homeland, like a kind of home in sort of the possibilities that were opened up by the creativity of computing itself. And so like a writer like Bruce Sterling would say, yeah, that's true. He says because computers are not independent of psychological questions of identity and psychological identity, but in many cases we have in fact projected our psychological identity onto computers itself. And if you look at the advertisements for like, you know, digital reality, it really plays that in it for marketing purposes. You know, there's a PC personality and a Mac personality. There's like Nike personality. The questions of identity themselves have also been really appropriated by the corporations and who really begin to think about this itself. So Deborah Lufton comes back to this and she said, yeah. She says, you know, when you live in, a, in the era of, of cyberspace and digital reality, that the question of the computer technology is not separate from our identity. In fact, it even goes deeper than that because computer technology introduces like also a projection of the deepest social fears and anxieties of our culture. And she says in many ways, and she talks about the, the notion, I think it's on page, it's on page um, 485. She has really a great section of this book on page 485 in which she talks about risky computing. You know, and here she's making the thesis. She says that, you know, one of the great changes that happens under the stress of rapid technological change, of rapid technological change, is that suddenly, you know, computing itself becomes like risky activity. And, you know, the dis public discussions take place on, in terms of if you have like a wireless culture. Are you exposing, for example, children to pedophiles? What about possibilities for child abuse? What happens to us in terms of viruses itself? What are the security risks of computing? What are the sexual risks? What are the risks of crashed hard drives? What are the risks of viral infection? What are the risks if you can have like cyber utopians moving through you know, wireless networks? Then at the same time, why can't you have cyber terrorists who also use cell phones and the very latest advances in digital technology and encryption technology. So in this section on risky computing, Deborah Lufton makes the argument that, I'll uh, just read two lines. She says, in the age of risk society, this is on page 485, personal computers constitute sites that are redolent, you know, filled with cultural anxieties about the nature of humanity and the self. The late modern world is fraught with danger and risk. The promise of modernity has like a double-edged character it just doesn't guarantee human progress. It also opens up us up to risks ourselves. And so really, the, all the articles in this section, you know, really say, well, if we're going to talk about this fourth stage of technology, this stage of technology associated with digital reality, then we have to talk about questions of psychological identity and also questions of risk. Now, I just introduce, interject against that in some ways, though, a completely different perspective that at the same time as you could make the argument, as like Deborah Lufton wants to make the argument, that risky computing exists. And that if you have a wired culture, that to the extent that the culture becomes like so deeply wired, when you crash a computer, it's no computer system, it's no longer something of simply individual consequence. But there's the possibility now, of course, when you crash computer systems, you begin to crash society itself. So it really is risky computing because, in fact, the irony of like centralization of society is you not only centralize possibilities for, you know, you know, easier banking, more fluid movements of the population, but you also open up the culture and the society to possibilities of, in fact, it's being crashed almost as a hard drive. 
I was going to take a flight once out of the Toronto airport and just left downtown Toronto. And just by the time I took a cab from downtown Toronto to the airport, a fire broke out in one of the main switching stations for network wires in the financial districts of Toronto. I didn't know anything about it. All I knew is that I had to get some money. So take my credit. I had to make a phone call. So I take my credit card, put in bank of 50 phones, doesn't accept my credit card. I thought something's very weird here. Go to the ATM machine, no luck. And then you look over at the screen and they suddenly talk about, well, the financial district is down today. In fact, a good part of the financial movements of the country are down today. So like Deborah Lufton in this article in Risky Computing is really saying that you know there are kind of ironic and unexpected effects of things like centralization and speed culture and network culture itself. And the other thing that she might have opened up, but of course, you know, it doesn't exist at the time of what she's writing. It's really this thing that if you have a culture that is really a technological culture, that the people that will get to use the technology will not just be hackers or the computer industry itself, but what about cyber terrorists? Like, what about all this literature that now exists that says that the way in which, you know, like networks of terrorism exist is that they're not anti-technological, at least they might be anti-technological in their rhetoric, but actually, in the operations of the act of terrorism, they're hyper-technological. They use you know, cell phones. They use the latest configurations and data computing for movements of vast migratory flows of money itself. They have surveillance systems. They use very careful encryption techniques itself. So what happens when the global village is not just filled with you know, religiously utopian visions of technology or hardworking people working in the computer industry, but what happens, in fact, when cyber terrorists themselves begin to swim very easily within the flows of the data networks itself? And I would just add one other perspective itself on this, just in terms of thinking about risky computing. I mean, is Deborah Lofton really correct in this article that we are in a society of risky computing? Or is the cultural consequence of computing exactly the opposite? Is the real seduction of computing not that it introduces risk, but that the real seduction of computing is that it introduces the minimization of risk. That the cultural condition out of which computing develops is a suburban cultural condition. And that computers themselves are like the perfectly, you know, the perfect suburban technology. They're intended for radical social isolation, intended to break down communities and wire people into you know, simply crowds of people who live together and go off to work in the day, therefore like rewiring a society itself. Do computers represent not really a seductive wish to be connected with others, but do computers represent sort of the seductive suburban wish to be cut off from others and to be cut off most of all from oneself? Are computers a way of really alienating yourself from yourself? So Deborah Lofton in this article, which I think is really a great article, wants to talk about risky computing. But I would say, well, maybe computing is exactly the opposite. Maybe computing is driven forward by the desire for the no-risk society, for the riskless society, for a society in which you basically, at a psychological level, wish to cut yourself off from oneself. And I've always been sort of intrigued with the question not from a technical level or a historical level, but from a cultural level, is why did computers appear now? And not only why did computers, this kind of technology, appear now, but why, in fact, has a good part of the world that gets wired been so receptive to wireless, the image of wireless culture itself? And in this course, you know, we've had lots of different answers to that. You had Marshall McLuhan saying it's a religious epiphany, you know, the desire for communication with others. But is it possible? that computers are something entirely different? Is it possible that computers are about the appearance of, I don't know what I could call, like abject culture? And abject culture, and they're sort of related to it. That computers are, have something about them that are really deeply ambivalent. That there's something that we, see, we simultaneously both love and fear, but they're also a way by which we disconnect ourselves from ourselves that the faster that we communicate, the less probably that we have to say. That we're supposed to be living in a information society, but it's very difficult to be informed and to develop like a kind of coherent perspective ourselves. 
are the screens that we thought we were only watching, have they in fact come inside? And have we in fact become addicted to sort of flowing a kind of speed currents and smoothly within screen culture? Have we in fact become in some real way kind of seduced appendages of the technology so that there's no longer like a clear division between my body and myself and the technologies that we thought we were only using. And that's really the beginning of like Sandy Stone's article because Sandy Stone says, okay, will the real body please stand up? And Sandy Stone's an interesting person to ask this question because here is Sandy Stone, you know, who's a transsexual, who's in fact moved from the body of a guy to the body of a woman. In the middle of doing this, she then works as in, in the, you know, one of the original people working within the gaming industry itself. And her books have like such great stories about, you know, the early stories of the development of the gaming industry in California. You know, like intense preoccupation with projects which go on for months at a time. And then you get the phone call or you get, you know, a message comes over the wire saying the financing didn't work out, junk the project. And the next thing you know, you've got big landfill sites filled with, you know, reams of computer programming and sort of dead dreams of programming itself. So Sandy Stone, when she says real, the real body stand up, is really talking about two bodies all the time. Of course, she's talking about her own body. Like what does it mean to have the body of a woman but the mind of a man? What does it also mean, and Sandy Stone would say, when you're in cyberspace and you become very uncertain as to who is who in cyberspace? And what kind of relationship do you have with those in cyberspace itself? Now Sandy Stone says the one thing that she knows, you know, the basis of her thesis, is that she says see, we have new kinds of bodies in this fourth dimension of technology. She says we have really blurred bodies, like we're living at blurred boundaries. And that echoes many themes that we've heard in different readings itself. She says we are people of the Mestiza. We are people of the borderlands. We are people who live in the borderlands. We are, have illegible bodies, not easy to write on or to decipher, which live in real time between the borders of the organic and the borders of, the tech and the borders of technology. In a significant way for Sandy Stone, we are all mestizos now, that we are all mestizos searching for what constitute the new kind of borderlands itself. And so really on this thesis, she says that the only way really to think about cyber bodies is don't think about it in the abstract, but think it in about it in the particular. Think about particular cases. And she begins with the story of Julie, right, in this article. She says, Julie, you know, is the story of a middle-aged neo programmer who presents himself, no, that's incorrect, who presents herself on the net not as a middle-aged, half-cynical male programmer, but as a disabled, older woman available to give advice to others. A disabled, older woman with a very sympathetic ear. Suddenly people get in contact with this disabled, older woman offering sympathy, but she also does counseling. And suddenly there is these very authentic encounters on the net between people seeking help and it's disabled, older woman itself. She takes confidences in. She's really intimate with people's lives itself. And for Sandy Stone, you know, she doesn't write this judgmentally. She says, in fact, this middle-aged programmer, in fact, probably becomes like so seduced by, in fact, having an alternative persona, a kind of Jungian shadow self, that they begin, in fact, to find their real self is really the self of this older disabled woman itself dispensing some good advice itself. So Sandy Stone says, really, when we think about this and think about this, she says, well, what is the realities? You know, what kind of conclusions can we draw from that? Is this a case simply of abuse, like cyber abuse in the net, complete misrepresentation? Or in fact, in this case, do you have this case of, you know, abject culture? You know, a person who lives within two bodies, the body of a middle-aged man and a programmer or the body of a disabled older woman itself? Or are we talking about something else? Are we talking about the fact that network culture 
is opens up possibilities for vampire culture. Then, in fact, you can take on different identities. You can take on the identity of a disabled older woman. And on the basis of this kind of vulnerability and fright, you then draw others into your spider's web itself. Is this a case of like real viciousness? Back to your first name. Why would they be assuming a body if they don't have to? Yeah. You know, like what's the point in saying I'm a woman, but you know, on the internet when you're really a man? Yeah. If it, you know, why does it matter what your body is in fact? Like what are assuming what? Oh no, that's a really good insight. And why, in fact, within cyberspace, within like wireless culture, do we continue to project different roles into the internet itself? And Yeah, and what does Amy have to say about this? <laughs> <laughs> well, because you were speaking about that last week yeah. with Lisa Nakamura's article, Identity Tourism. Yeah, it's a yeah, good I response. Really here and then here, James. Can you go for Do you want to go first? I just want to go ahead. It's, it's because by embracing the other stereotype, like I'm not you, too, but embracing the other stereotype, you're also reinforcing it with another one. Yeah. Like if I say, oh, I'm not a woman because of this, then I'm, you know, I'm in, like saying that I'm stereotyped by being a woman. You know, by putting yourself into another stereotype, you're saying, yes, my body fits me and who it is, so therefore, you know what I mean? By yeah. assuming another stereotype, you're backing up the fact that, yes, I am stereotyped and I'm trying to escape it, you know? So maybe, though, that the net is like this junkyard of stereotypes and projection of stereotypes. <coughs> yeah, but and I'm just saying, you know, if you're really moving forward into cyberspace, then it should be a space where there is no body, where there is no assuming of identity. Not that I don't think that we can do that, because I don't think that our little culture that's been for us all thought of our body as we're not, I don't think we're capable of it, because we have so many stereotypes and so many, you know, like, for us, the first thing that comes into our head when we see someone, or a new baby, is like, oh, it's a boy or a girl, you know, it's anything, and I don't think that we can pull ourselves out of that. But in, like, ideal, if you want to think about it, like, cyberspace would be a really great place to be able to do that, and pull yourself out of that physical identity. And just say it's a bit, and then it's sort of... I'm just, just fooling around. <laughs> I, try, I have to ask that my question myself. <laughs> it's very good. That's just a really good, re really good reflection, James. I think the part of politics there that, that we're having is a matter of definition. When people see, say identity, and they think, well, what do you look like? Are you a man? Are you a woman? So things like that. And a lot of, of, of what makes a person's identity doesn't have to do with their, their sex or anything else. It's more a matter of personality, of the way they see themselves, of the way they, they, they see the world. I mean, look at the, what you were saying, uh, I think it was the, uh, I think you wrote the article, uh, Chris Sandy, she was, she was a transsexual, and she yeah. went through sex recovery, things, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's, I mean, it, the thing is, when you talk about identity, or what identity people assume over the internet, whatever, it's not really the thing of it, more that they're you know, choosing not to make their identity dependent upon their their body, their physicality, their physicality yeah. rather than their their projections or how they they, they want to be seen, who they see, who they would be if they could be. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah, so, so like, yeah, so like really virtual bodies then. Yeah. 
it's nice. Um, yes? And that's what, like, when people found this out, they were outraged. It's a real famous snap case because people were just outraged. Same with yours, like the male mind colonizing the you know, representational image of an, older, the, of an older disabled woman, both to attract sympathy and then to elicit real confidences and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and this was interpreted as like, Yeah. Yeah, and this was interpreted by a lot of people, and then it was like predatory male behavior. So, but Sandy is a bit more ambivalent on this because she says, on the other hand, will the real body please stand up? Maybe this middle aged male programmer's real body, his real mind is that of an older disabled woman. Will the real body please stand up? What's the realm of fantasy and imagination in life itself? And Sandy Stone's really, you know, she entertains this question. Do you have your hand up? Do you have your hand up? Oh, sorry, I got it. <laughs> okay. I got it. <laughs> sorry. Well, just, I don't know. I'm just trying, it's more just playing devil's, devil's advocate because in the sense you're saying, okay, well, uh, the programmer's personality or his mind or entity could have been that of an old, you know, might, the real body could have been that of an older woman. Right. But you're still saying it as it could have been that of an older woman. So like, why would that be the personality of an older woman? Could that just be the personality of a programmer that, Yeah, no, that's true. I just, I don't know, and that's the thing is that. Well, will the real identity stand up then? Yeah, like it shouldn't necessarily be. It, I don't know, and I don't think that we can pull ourselves out of like putting a physical identity onto an individual. Because even if you would meet someone, say for example, you would meet someone in a chat room, and you end up like finding them super uncommon and whatever, you know, and, and this person turns out to be like mentally someone that you're like just by talking that you're like falling in love with or whatever. Like, if it turns out that, say, I would be typing, and it turns out that it would be a female, I'd probably be like, oh, my goodness, that's a female. And well, not me. Anyway, yeah. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just saying, like, you know, you, you people yeah. aren't in general, aren't open to people's identities to always have that physical attachment. And, I mean, like, I do. I'm sure everyone in this room does. But it's just, in the ideal world, it should be people connect on what, like, yeah. their mental. But what if the real connection is, like, I don't know if you, you see it. There's a short article in the paper the other day, just a short little thing. A 21 year old student went to Purdue University and graduated, a woman. And I sort of read that because I went to Purdue at one time. And I said, oh, someone just graduated. And then she was involved with uh, sadomasochistic websites. And she met this guy on the website who was uh, an engineer and he was from Kansas or somewhere out west. And she went to travel to meet him and stuff like this. And really for SMs, you know, for SM rituals of sex. And the only problem was that what he didn't tell her on the website is he was a serial killer. So his whole thing was, you know, having sex and sadomasochistic, but then taking that the other dimension, no safe words. In fact, then uh, killing them, and then he loved to put people in barrels. So the FBI now in the States has been finding these uh, women, you know, they're really brutally murdered and in barrels. And all this is meanwhile has been is really deeply part of like sort of a web connection. That's where people have been meeting. And, you know, so like when you talk about representations of self, well, I think Sandy Stone's thing really is a lot of like, will the real body please stand up? And what is, how do you negotiate the space between like your s cyber body who you present yourself as and what's actually really happening? And then I would just say one other thing is part of the problem really is in fact that there's like an, you know, like a, I don't even know the word to describe it, like this bedded, embedded fact that won't go away. The people do have these real bodies. People do have real histories. And sometimes you can go from net technology or from technology and you fall back either into your own body or into some other story about their body and their kind of fantasies and things like this. So I think that's why the, this section in cyber bodies is really pressing. 
because they're really trying to do two things at one time. And every one of these articles really trying to talk about, you know, the dangers and the possibilities of net bodies. And then the other hand, it's sort of like the, the, the context for it is the fact that people have real life experiences and real bodies and real fantasies and real tragedies. And, you know, that's happening. That's an, an, a fact. And people also are going through a cycle from birth to death. And that has real mystery associated with it. And sometimes, you know, the people blank out the mysteries by netting themselves, and other times they're not able to. So it just it tr struck me, the article after article, and this just really complex, because it touched the mysteries of life, I guess, in some ways. Although I'm not confident of that. Cool, because when I read these articles, you get you sort of your confidence is sort of shattered. You say, well, sort of human, but you sort of also everyone, if you like it or not, everybody here is post-human. Everyone here through our lifetime will have genetic engineering will take its toll on us in one way or another. We're all streamed. I, I don't think any of us really understands the effects of rapid technological change on ourselves and our life prospects <coughs> and our most intimate relationships, and certainly on politics and you know, the economies within which we live. These are really, you know, really mysteries that are being worked out and they're happening so fast. So I should, can I just, I just want to go James. Is that okay? Yeah. Uh, but the, the idea of the separation of uh, the identity and the body, I mean, I mean, if you look at the, at Audrey Price science fiction, if you think of that, we're going back for two decades and that, that's been a, a big theme in the industry is why there's something like that around JJ series or, mm. you know, among others, I mean, the Orson Scott card, the, yeah. the story you wrote of, Ghost of Inuka when the Indian game says end of game. Yeah. I mean, where is the kids in the uh, group who, who start talking on the net, they, they, get, they get hacked for constructive play in the real world. Like, no one would think that kids could go on and they're going to be chatting and all these sort of fun, basic things. But on the net, no one thinks that they could chat with people about these things. That's and pretty nice. That's, that, that's the thing is it doesn't, re it doesn't matter what you relate, but people's stereotypes uh, aren't really there, uh, aren't any. No one, there's no one set against the It's true. Yeah, it's performance. It's like, I was in a cyber shop, a really good company in San Francisco. Oh, sorry, sorry, just one second. Cyber shop in San Francisco, and I really liked it because the, the guy who was running it says, I said, well, how do you hire people? Because they were really a hotshot San Francisco company and getting big contracts and stuff, and they had the best designers. He said, well, we have a very simple test. He said, we could care less what education you have. He said, that's absolutely irrelevant. He says, we have a computer. You sit down, show us what you can do. He says you can either do something interesting or you can't, and then we hire people or we don't. And I thought, well, that's really, you know, just you can see the end of a bureaucratic way of life and professionalization. That all just is blown aside. And something else like really performance related, you know, like you, you're as good as you can perform, actually. It's pretty interesting. And for while the tech uh, boom lasted, it was really liberating for a generation, I think. And I think what's happening now is this really reformation period of the bureaucracies trying to gain the upper hand once more. So. Sorry, Sash. No, I was uh, just more just a quick just question about it. I was interested in your reading on the modernization or you know, um, any form of genetic manipulation you could find as post human. And I, I was just curious to know if there's a map to your thoughts on that or what that means. I just think about magic. But how is it 
that comfortable uh, that it's an analyzer that you're willing to make? I think so. That's one of the parameters. Is post human? No. No, not like a, I'm just it's using this. Everyone, all of us taking that amount of post human in that we have been genetically modified or Yeah, and not just by, <laughs> that was, well, I think that was a spectral voice. <laughs> that was the voice of the post-human there, we had it. <laughs> yeah, and not just, well, in the sense that human bodies themselves have been streamed. You think you're like being streamed by the wires, but actually people's bodies are streamed by pharmacology, streamed by like radical changes in not just the content of perception, but actually the, like, I think digitality has basically, seems to me like a lot of, um, interesting research going on at Stanford and Harvard of the impact of digitality upon human perception itself. And I think that sort of seems to bear fruit and really true that in fact there's a such a thing as digital consciousness itself. And you see that like in the game these kids are playing and will soon be like majority consciousness society of mist. I'd say it's not, it's not like a determinate thing, but I would say post-human re refer to the fact that at some point we no longer have simply bodies of flesh and blood. We really have recombinant bodies. We have identities that begin to float that are a little separate from us. And we begin to have effects on the body which are exceed the technologies themselves. And we become very comfortable with that. Like I'll just quickly use another example that Sandy Stone uses because it strikes me as what I would mean by post-human. She uses the example, she says, well, part of the net culture is that you have like sort of invisibility and you have to oftentimes have to have very quick transactions where you have to really describe in serial detail, call up human desires. And she says, when, who calls up human desires? And you have to do it on a 15 minute basis or 20, she says phone sex workers. She says like, if you go to phone sex, and she's done a lot of case studies and a lot of work on phone sex work, she says, where here's like a real challenge. You have to, through the gesture and the tone of your voice and the kind of verbal codes that you will use, you have to, motivate, you know, like call forth like really hot desire in a really cold medium. This cold medium of the telephone itself. If you stand apart from that, like it seems like a bizarre kind of thing that happens. It's like normal life. It's predominant use of telephones, it seems, and of the net culture itself. And Sandy Stone looks at, you know, phone sex workers. She says, well, no one's more of a cyborg in our culture than a phone sex worker who's creating like a, you know, like a situation of like passionate desire and calling up like, you know, the talking the language of seduction when the material reality is people sitting, phone sex workers like in Montreal, sitting in usually in tiny little booths in cold concrete warehouse kind of spaces or sometimes working out of their home, doing any kind of different activities and calling up hot desire itself. You know, have you seen that? What's the name of that movie that's... Girl Six. Excuse? Girl Six. Girl Six? No. <laughs> oh. I'll get it at the break. I'll just think there's a, I'll get it because I want to give the example of this movie because it really actually focuses on phone sex work and it really focuses on exactly this. I mean, but Sandy Stone's argument is that this is like also the train of post-human bodies because suddenly desire is not really just attached to your body. It's not the intimacy <coughs> of relationships. It's like telematic desire. It's hot desire in a cold medium. Yeah. To imply an afterlife. Yeah. A and, and like it's, that's okay when we're using it with, with words like postmodern and so on because it, it, it implies an end to what we used to call modernism and, and, an, and an ability to alter and, 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 and after yeah. an ideology. But when you put it before something like, like, like humanity, yeah. we're putting it before or death. And, and to do that is to empower humans to be the only species that I know of in the world with the ability to end themselves. Not just, in, not just in quantitative measures, exactly. but, in, but in actual... Yeah, that's why we're a culture that's suiciding itself to well, virtual that's death. Said, that's what I'm saying, not just in quantitative way. I'm not just talking about suicide. I'm not, I'm not talking about our ability to destroy ourselves, which... No, I'm not talking about that. Talking to improve about, ourselves. Okay, what about, well, I mean, sui I've never seen suicide as a form of improvement, but... <laughs> well, <laughs> well, read medical pharmacology's things. Suicide? Yeah, n not the question of suicide, but it, what is equivalent to social suicide. Like the whole publicity spiel that comes out of the industry of molecular biology and psychopharmacology and recombinant genetics, it's never 
it's never a given in the language of what we're really doing is we are harvesting the human species. No, but no, you don't talk, no, that's what I mean. They don't talk about the language of nothing's being destroyed. The language is, do you want a longer life span? Would you like better health? Would you like some way, in fact, if you're going to have a heart attack, say you're in your 50s or your 40s and you're hardworking and you like just to have some warning in advance that, in fact, your stress levels are too high and you better take it easy before you have a stroke or a heart attack, that can be offered. And that, you know, is the medical language of seduction and facilit I would call like an ideology of facilitation that comes out of genetic engineering, you know, when it's because made commercial it's itself. Like the same with of looking at a hot dog pizza from Sony, it used to call it being better than that. Technology, the ability to, you know, dietarily know what to eat or to eat a, a certain thing or whatever. But now you, it seems postmodernism has become the, the academic doctrine of choice or whatever. We now instead of calling it betterment, we're calling it radical alteration, if not yeah. well, remember the humans, no, that's humans and along the modernists, so now what comes next? I know, it's terrible. Well, it's, but it's just, it's just, if, it's, if it's just a tool of kind of poetic and metaphorical rhetoric, No, it's not, no, it's not. Think of the film like After Darwin. Like After Darwin's really asking a radical question. It says when you have the human genome code and it has been broken and you can basically begin to code evolution itself, then you in fact are talking of a break. You're talking about a break in which like something that you know, was never under human mastery before, which is to say you know, the complexities of evolution, you know, going blind paths and dead paths and sometimes other things happening, is suddenly at least has the illusion of being brought under a certain kind of control. And that's why like a lot of um, thinkers now and writers are really saying, well, let's think about the notion of the post-human. Have we are a culture that has actually gone beyond a basic historical break, that there really is a before and an after, and we're, you know, without even thinking about it, no public debate whatsoever, we have consigned ourselves to be the first species that has really decided, for better or for worse, to basically end itself and begin something new. That's the, like, there's a very good book called, there's an author called uh, uh, Leolton, L Leonton, and he's a Harvard biologist wrote a book called Biology is Ideology, and that's basically the thesis of the book itself. Works in Harvard, you know, as a molecular biologist and well-known one, but himself thinks ethically and culturally, what are, the you know, what are the consequences of breaking the human genome code? What does decoding really mean? And his conclusion he draws is we're really, we can speak reasonably, not in poetical language, but in reasonably, of the fact that we are in the beginning stages, like the infant stages, of building bodies. And it won't be a human body, it'll be I mean, why do you need human bodies for commercial purposes? I mean, what would be the best body for an office worker? I bet if we sat down and thought about this for a few minutes. I mean, office. Like yeah. Well, <laughs> office. Like yeah. Well, yeah. they're just. No, I'm sorry. They're just. They're just specialized th kind of things. The army itself is thinking about that. There was an article in the paper yesterday that said, you know, the um, U.S. Army with a large project that's coming out of um, MIT. <coughs> is in fact taking, is trying to develop like sort of like genetic fiber skin so that you can have soldiers who will actually have skin grown so that they can do two things. One, they can go into dangerous situations and basically be rendered invisible. And at the same time that every inch of the flesh will be a communication system so that you can in fact avoid friendly fire incidences where you kill your own soldiers. In fact, you will be lit up. Now that's basic, just builds on Every biology textbook that's sold at the Concordia bookstore, at least last time I went through, usually begins with the story of the phosphorescent cow that the Japanese bio molecular biologists did. They put, you know, the firefly genes inside a cow, and they begin to light up mammals from inside. So I assume that, that in some ways this research sort of just is a human application of that, you know, kind of experimentation in animals itself. So it's not in that poetic sense, but in that just like very practical commercial sense. You know, we are in a new, without our consciousness catching up to it, we are in a world of technology where, in fact, we're going to build another species, but it's not necessarily going to be a thing called a human species. It will be something else. It's just, and I, I'm not exaggerating this. I'm, I'm being very, very moderate. Because you just have to, I think, here. That's being moderate. <laughs> That's not moderate. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Jim. Part of the, the thing that about creativity, though, is the, I mean, we, we tend to look for, for things, we tend to let our curiosity go away, and we think, you know, we, 
find, and we can use what, what we find. I mean, look at medical to technology. I mean, there's um, prosthetic um, limbs replacing in, in internal organs, human glasses, or which are things to enhance sight. I mean, well, we, we change ourselves, we, we change our, our, our environments, yeah. we, we build tools all the time. And I can't really just, just say that, like, that, that when we're short term, it makes us less than human. I mean, that would be like saying if someone has a, a big, bad wound heart or whatever, is is it as human as someone who does it with a natural heart? I mean, no, it's, it's, that's, it's, that's true. It's and movies have thought about this, say Blade Runner. Yeah. Because Blade Runner, I mean, that's the thesis uh, I, of Blade I mean, Runner. I mean, yes, it may not be, be the, the same thing that, that, that humanity was, but I mean, we, we look, look at us. I mean, we're, 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 like I said, we, we're not the same humans who were here a thousand years ago or 10,000 years ago, ago even. I mean, just because we're not the same ones doesn't mean that they're no longer human. No, they could but be. A term like post-human implies that, that they aren't human anymore. Okay, so why don't, don't we change the term? that everything we've done to this point has been natural. And, and only since we developed the ability to create strong species or, or, or go into enhance that, that it was at that kind of clear-cut line that we stopped being natural. So industrialism was natural. Uh, sedentary lifestyle was natural. And everything that no, the human doesn't. Us was no, but that's the ability to live outside of the so-called natural organic body has been natural. Yeah, no, that's a really good argument. But it's, I don't think that it's that simple. So I don't think that our meaning of the human is that it's something natural and that you're nostalgic for the natural. It just is really a question of what is the, at what point does technological momentum in fact really become phenomenally intense to the point that it, it actually literally st stresses not just our, our bodies, it stresses the very notion of a species line, a species existence. I mean, I think that's real for myself, just, you know, it's no way, correct answer to this, just we're trying to think this through. But at what point does the species will itself to extinguishment? I think that's... I think that's the key word there, is that we're, 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 we're a culture at this point in time that has been given, and I'm not going to call it luxury, but has been given the opportunity to rationalize and think about the concept of technological existence. So, so relatively the first time in, in history, when industrialization came along, manpower was needed for industrialization. So all of a sudden we had the the opportunity, if not the luxury, to kind of contemplate what technological existence means. And I imagine it's no coincidence yeah. that at that given moment where we've been given the opportunity to contemplate it, we realize that it's a point where it's not as much. We, or we, contemplate we spit in its yeah, space. But, well, but it's the first time that kind yeah. of civilization has really examined itself on a, on a, on a daily yeah. sort of session basis. Okay, but there was a really good, uh, among a number of really good papers in class was a paper by Nathaniel and Ketriano, who wrote a paper and did a piece of music on after crash. And the thesis of that paper is that we are living in a period of not crash, but of after crash. Something else has happened. I thought that's a pretty nice evocative term for the culture in which we're living. So maybe it's that kind of thing. I mean, the crash has happened. The crash happened you know, 20 days before I was born. I was born in 1945. And about 20 days before I was born, the US Air Force, for purely experimental reasons, war was one they had carpet bombed Japan to oblivion. They you know, burned the cities. And they drew up a, they told Truman that they were going to uh, drop an experiment with an atomic weapon for warning purposes, only on military targets. So Truman signed off. Those uh, military targets were Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And so they dropped atomic weapons on these cultures, purely kind of radical experiment. And the lesson that I would draw from that is like here's a culture that prides itself in being the spearhead of a liberal culture and a technological culture. But what does it mean when a liberal culture, not a fascist culture, but a liberal culture, <coughs> says that we will take it into our hands, that we will end history in a very specific sense, that we will begin to be able to control the life and death of cultures. We can change the categories in time and space. We don't even talk about time any longer, but we talk about like real time and suppose that that has some relationship to time of duration of bodies or just social time that you know, or we can end space. So I'd say, at least in my lifetime, I have always lived in a culture that has been suiciding itself, optimistically. It's like a really kind of crazy combination. It's not done by evil people either. It's done with the best of intentions sometimes. And I'm not, you know, that's just my perspective, I'm just, but I'm saying that it seems to you that when you have genetic engineering coming on the scene and you have like, I just really encourage you, if you ever get a chance, go hear molecular biologists or genetic engineers talk. Go to any medical convention 
or better still, go to the uh, you know the booths where they're selling products, or just go up on the web and, and see the language in which they sell products. They will they are selling the most delirious Frankensteinian schemes in the most banal language of petty optimism and kind of cheap hucksterism. You say, well, well, these are like freak experiments, but and you know what they're saying is like freakish. You know, it's like really like radical experimentations with the body and really radical envisionings of what would be the possibilities getting beyond this body. Like one of the companies down in Massachusetts run by a CEO, Michael West, who, uh, you know, a Chicago biologist who was giving a talk once and said, well, you know Michael West? I said, no, because I had mentioned his company and these kind of freakish experiments they were doing. And he said, well, Michael West is like really influenced by Francis Bacon's book, Novum Organum, where the book posits a thesis that the one thing science cannot do, it cannot solve the problem, which ultimately will get everyone in this room that you wish to overcome death. And Michael West is like driven crazy by the fact that science is not going to save him, that he's, you know, he will die. And so he, in fact, then has invested his life in genetic engineering with the idea of, in fact, creating a virtual body, a body that has the possibility of overcoming the last frontier, the frontier of mortality itself. So just in that sense, you know, that seems to be the momentum in part of the times in which we live. And it's why good liberal thinkers are starting to use terms like post-human and say, what is happening? You know, what, what are the broader cultural conditions in which we live? I mean, what makes